Well, today's topic has certainly captured your interest and curiosity. And as I said, over 300 of you registered to attend. And I know many more people will be watching it either live on Facebook stream or on the recording. If you are watching live, then please do say hello. I can't see your comments, but I know Maria will be able to. But if you're watching it on the playback, then please do let us know if you're watching it on playback. Um, in the comments, just said watch on, uh, on uh, playback and let us know what you've taken away from today's session. Now, my guest today is career change coach, Rachel Schofield. Now, Rachel worked for the BBC for 20 years years as a journalist and news presenter. See, you know, I just get so many fantastic guests on our, on our sessions. So you're in for a treat today. Now, before training as a personal development coach, um, she was working with the BBC and was a, was a reporter uh, with them and a journalist and um, qualified with the Coaching Academy as a coach in 2019. Now, Rachel also uh, published a book earlier this year uh, called Career Change Guide, The Five Steps to Finding Your Dream Job. And uh, she worked alongside Pe uh, Penguin, the publishers uh, for this. And she specialises in helping people figure out what fulfilling work looks like for them and how to get there. She also works four days a month for uh, divers diversity, equity and inclusion consultancy um, and provides workshops and small group coaching for corporate women's leadership programs. So she comes with us a wealth of experience to share today. So I hope that you've got your coaching journal. Look, I've got a new one this month. It's all lovely and sparkly. So do make sure you have your coaching journal or whatever medium that you use to record your, your learnings and, and takeaway points because you're going to need it today. Because I think with changing attitudes to work, more and more people than ever are considering reshaping their careers, looking for support to do so, making career change coaching an important part of many coaches toolkits. So we've got lots to, to, to chat about today. So I'm going to dive straight in and say welcome, Rachel. And thank you so much for, um, for giving up your precious time. I know you've come straight off a group coaching call. So we'll have a chat about that. So thank you. I hope my introduction has given you a chance just to grab your uh, sort of a, a, a little breather before we, we start all over again. But let's start by just, um, well, a place that I, I sort of take all of my guests, really, because it is our stories, our, the journey of our stories that really sort of makes us unique and, and who we are. And I find that really fascinating about people. So if you don't mind just sort of sharing maybe a little bit about, first of all, your journey in becoming a coach and maybe a little bit about the, um, the area that you specialise in. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to be here. This is like old times, being back on a coaching academy call. Although when I trained, of course, pre-COVID, we were still in the zone of some of it being in person and a mix of, of hybrid. But now the world has gone Zoom, uh, Zoom mad. It makes it all very easy. I love seeing how far everyone's come and all around the world. Um, but thank you. No, it's lovely to be back with the coaching academy. And yeah, I, like all coaches, I think, I've, I've yet to meet a coach who says I left university or I left school and became a coach. We all have a kind of hinterland, don't we? So I, as you kindly said in your introduction, I spent 20 years plus probably at the BBC. I only ever worked for the BBC. I did modern languages at university. I did a postgraduate year to train as a broadcast journalist, started with the BBC in local radio and TV. Hello, BBC Radio Newcastle. If anyone's up in the Northeast, that's where I cut my teeth as a journalist and then worked my way up. I went and did some work as a reporter on Radio 4 at Woman's Hour with the very scary Jenny Murray, who was the presenter there, um, and You and Yours, which is the flagship consumer programme on Radio 4, and then spent the bulk of my time at the BBC as a presenter on the BBC News Channel, what used to be BBC News 24 and became the news channel, Rolling News. Um, and enjoy it very much. I think like a lot of people, we've all got more than one career in us, but it also got to the point where I've been doing it a long time. I'm based in London and however glamorous and sexy TV sounds, in some ways, it's just like any other job. You do the same thing for long enough. You think, is this, is this it for the next 20 years? So I did what a lot of my career change coaching clients now do, which is that moment of thinking, I think I'd like to try something else. But 
you know, what does that look like? What am I equipped to do? Which bits of my work do I want to hang on to? Which ones do I want to get rid of? Who am I? What am I great at? What could I be, you know, what would someone pay me to do? Um, and long story short, yeah, I, I thought about various things, but was interested in coaching. And it was literally that it was just that sort of flicker of an interest. I didn't know any coaches, but I could see some parallels. I thought I like asking questions. I like people. I'm curious as a person. I'm interested in people's stories. But what had started to drive me a bit mad at the BBC and as a journalist is you spend a lot of time asking questions of people who don't really want to answer them, <laughs> particularly politicians. And, you know, this was the era of Brexit and Trump. And, and I think I thought I'd like to use these skills in a different way. So I did what a lot of people on the call will have done is I went along to the, the taster session, which back then for the Coaching Academy was at a, a nice hotel in South Kensington. We were in person. That's just down the road from me in Chiswick. It seemed like this is a no brainer. Went along, thought, yeah, I think I'm I'm interested and signed up for the course. That was, yeah, 2019. And I did I did the course over the period of about a year and got my qualification then in 20, early 2020. And then had the question of what do I, I've got a piece of paper. I've got a growing skill set, but what do I do with it now? <laughs> so that was the original part of the journey, Sharon. Oh, I absolutely love that. And, and so funny, when you mentioned Women's Hour, I have such a strong memory of Women's Hour. Before I became a coach, um, I worked in the insurance sector. I was in learning and development and HR. And um, I went along to the chair. I, had to, I was organising some big event and I had to go to the chairman's house and meet the chairman's wife down in West Sussex. It was all a very sort of posh sort of area. And I can remember walking in to her kitchen and she had woman's hour on it. It all felt very sort of official and grown up. And, you know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> one day I might listen to woman's hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh look and Steve saying lots of men listen as well good for you Steve it's a yes, great program. they do absolutely absolutely but it's just quite interesting you know sort of it sort of when you when you hear people's stories it can really anchor you back to sort of different places what, what, I, what I found quite fascinating in in all of that were two things that you mentioned and one of those was the love of of asking questions um, and that, that you mentioned that we have more than one career sort of within us and, and the piece of paper. So maybe if you don't mind, we can just sort of maybe rewind a little bit to your time at the BBC. And what do you think potentially you learned there that has helped you to form your coach, coaching niche today? Yeah, good question. I'll, I don't know whether it's helped me form my niche. I'm very happy to talk more about niche in a moment. But I think in terms of that skill set, I think for people who are becoming a coach after doing something else, which is what most of us have done, it's important, isn't it, to, to sort of look back and see those threads that run through. And I think most of us can find them. It sometimes takes a bit of time. Sometimes we think, well, I used to be an accountant and now I'm a coach. How does that work? You know, how do I tell that story? Or, I, you know, I used to be a nurse and now I'm a coach. Will people look at me and go, well, why are you doing something totally different? But actually, and I do a lot of this work with, with career change clients, sometimes you can see the threads. And I think probably what I took from journalism into coaching was, yeah, was that ability, yes, to ask questions, different kind of questions. Obviously, you realize when you start training as a coach, you're not asking the kind of Jeremy Paxman Newsnight style, yes or no, minister, yes or no. You know, you, you don't want those black and white closed questions. You want those expansive questions. You're not trying to back someone into a corner. You're trying to open their thinking and help them with other perspectives. But I think there was definitely something about questioning. I think if you're a journalist, you're naturally nosy, which always makes a good coach. I think you have to be a good listener. Obviously, what you see on the telly for presenters is, you know, here I am grandstanding, asking my questions. But actually, as we know, as coaches, a good question only comes because you've listened to what someone has said. You don't just sit with your list. Well, maybe you do on when you're first with your pro bono clients going, what would be your goal? What is important? You know, you have your set of questions. But of course, when you get better, you're listening, you're listening, you're thinking, oh, that was interesting. Maybe I'll maybe we need to go there. Let me check with the client. You know, so I think probably some of those core skills that I had as a journalist. Yes, they needed absolutely maybe redirecting, fine tuning. 
but that ability to to, to listen, to question, maybe to analyze, although obviously as the coach, it's not always your job to analyze, it's to offer something back, but to sort of try and see what's the story here? What am I noticing? What are the themes that keep coming up in the same way you would if you were telling a story as a reporter, you're trying to think, what seem to be the important things here? What do I need to draw people's attention to? Whether that's an audience watching the telly or whether that's your client where you're saying, I, I, I'm noticing this or, it, it, could this be significant? I've heard this word a lot of times, you know. Um, so I think that that skill set definitely had burgeoned from from the journalism. The niche, I think, came came from elsewhere. Mm, brilliant. OK, well, maybe we'll dive into a little bit of niche um, uh, as we sort of go through. And in fact, it, it, it might sort of come up with what where we're going to sort of move on to next because one of the things you you mentioned sort of in your opening story was around the fact that um we all have more than one career within us and I think that is very evident particularly today in millennials and you know certainly in in the research that I've been doing around um, employee engagement and employee retention we are seeing that you know generally speaking because you can't sort of talk in absolutes but generally speaking you know millennials plus are looking for something you know not that sort of job for life they're you know they're they are career hopping um but let's talk then about career change coaching because that's one of the things that you sort of you you mentioned that you do can you share a little bit more about what that actually is and um, sort of the, the type of things clients bring to to yeah. to a session with you yeah so absolutely so just to kind of take you to how I got there, I've noticed somebody asking about kind of that decision and choosing that area, and it dovetails in nicely to your question, Sharon. So when I qualified as a coach, obviously I, I was I was a personal development coach. I could do anything, which is great because you've got this wonderful foundation. But as we know, having a sort of niche, you know, when you know, there are debates about it, but for me, I felt I'd like to have something. Where I started was because a lot of my pro bono practice clients as I clocked up my hours were people in my own world and that meant I worked initially with a lot of mums perhaps in their kind of 40s who had taken time out of work often to raise a family have a career break and were then getting to a point where the children were of an age or finances were such or whatever it was that they wanted to go back to work but a lot of women in particular, because that would happen to be my client base then, were finding as they re-engaged with the working world, they maybe thought, I'm not sure I want to go back to doing exactly what I was doing, either because they weren't sure they still had the, the desire or perhaps they had confidence that had wobbled. They thought, I'm a bit out of the loop with this sector. I haven't worked in PR for five years. I haven't been an accountant for the last 10 years. So I started working with a lot of women in that space. So women returners was kind of where I started. But what I quite quickly found, and this would be really interesting to hear from other people who are thinking about this space or, you know, already work in this space, career coaching, career change coaching particularly, is quite a challenging space to work in because obviously a lot of people you coach with don't know exactly what they want. But most clients, I would say, and feel free to disagree. I'm generalizing. But in a lot of coaching spaces, people come and, and getting the kind of goal from them, getting like, what, what do you want from this coaching? What's the ideal outcome? They have more of a sense of it. So, you know, if you work in health coaching, you know, you, your client knows I want to lose this much weight or I want to get fit. And OK, you're going to explore what does that look like? But it, it, it's sort of manageable. <laughs> Career change coaching is a bit like, you know, herding cats because people do know, yes, they want to do something different. They know they're not happy in their work. But the problem is the goal is I want to do something different. And that's lovely. But that, oh, that's quite a big goal because they don't really know what it looks like and what they want to do and what they could do. And there seem to be so many variables and how much they want to get paid. And how. so I soon realized that I created this sort of niche, but I was finding it quite a tricky space to coach in as a relatively new coach. I think it's different if you if you bring this into your practice when you're quite established. So I used to struggle a bit to think, how do we structure this? Because you'd have one really good session with a client, um, and this can be quite challenging, where you'd, they'd tell you everything that was wrong, and I don't like this, and, and you'd start to sort of think, how do we explore this? You know, we could look a bit at the sort of the values and 
Well, we could talk a bit about what jobs they've liked before, but then suddenly we'd go off on a massive tangent about the fact that their current boss is horrible. And we'd be trying to how do all these pieces fit together. So what I ended up doing and this, you don't, you know, there's no, this isn't me trying to say you need to do this, but I did an additional qualification because I felt a little bit like I wanted a bit more. And I did that with firework career coaching. It's only for coaches. It's not a coach training program. You can only do it if you are a coach. But that gave me a, a structure for people to work with. So what I now do in my practice, um, as I say, it's not all career changes, but when I'm working with career changes, and I think it can be a really helpful approach, whether you design it yourself or learn it from somewhere else, is to give people a little bit more structure than you might do in a traditional coaching relationship, which is obviously you want it still to be client led. You're not it's non-directive. You're not telling people what they should do. I'm not claiming to be an expert in the million careers there are in the world. But I do offer people and I think most career change coaches do. If you go nosing around at people's websites, you'll see, you know, there's a journey that you take people on to get them clear on things like well you know what are you good at what do you like doing what does the work you've done to date tell you about yourself what are your values what are the practical bits you know how much do you want to earn what kind of place do you want to work in what are you interested in you know are we looking for a passion career here is there anything from your interests to draw on or is that not a space we need to spend much time so I take people through initially quite a structured set of sessions that then sort of loosen up because we're trying to generate ideas and once we get to the point where they've got some ideas in play then it becomes more personal and perhaps more like traditional coaching where it's very client-led they're saying oh, I'm sort of interested in this and we're then saying okay so you've got this idea and this idea how could you explore those what are your options about finding out more about this idea that you'd like to be a graphic designer or you know what what's the issue why you know the people start going for interviews and maybe they hit issues with that and so we say okay so this is the new issue is you feel your applications are bombing or so then it becomes a little bit looser but yeah career coaching i think as a whole has a little bit offers a little bit more of a structure to people than some other kinds of coaching that would be my impression and that's certainly the way i work Hmm. So it sort of sounds like um, that um, you've got a really nice sort of framework that you work within and, and take the client through. Um, what would you say would be the, the major difference between career coaching per se and career change coaching? Hmm. Again, I think because I do work with people in both spaces. So I, some people I work with are, are just looking at their career. It's sort of what you might call career development coaching. Yes, so they just yes. want to come and say, you know, I think I want to go for a promotion or I think I need. I think, again, it's that sense of it takes longer to get to what the ideal outcome is. And you have to kind of sit with quite a lot of muddle which is challenging for the client because they're thinking, I've already sat with this muddle and I'm, you know, do I want to do this or do I want to do that? Or I've got 75 great ideas and I don't know which one it is, or I've got absolutely no ideas and where am I going to get those from? And I think as a coach, if you're not careful, you can take on the overwhelm of the client as well. You sort of like, I don't know. And of course, as a coach, you're not setting yourself up as I know, you're setting yourself up as let's partner and we'll work this out together. But you can... I think, and this, of course, is something that all coaches come across, but I think it's particular to career change coaching, is you can find yourself, particularly in the early stages, feeling like, oh, my gosh, I need to give the answers. They're looking for me to sort of listen to them and go, I've heard what you've said, and clearly you should be a librarian or, you know, whatever. They're almost they're expecting you to sort of diagnose them. So I think resisting that and helping them and yourself sit with the fact that there are lots of moving pieces to the puzzle at least initially is important whereas with career development it won't probably take so long in a coaching session to figure out that they're saying you know I think I need to work on my my impact in the office or I think I want to work on my leadership skill you know it's much quicker to okay you're going to explore it still and you don't know quite what it looks like but it's much more easily broken down and I like both um, mm -hmm. But initially, that career change space when you work in it as a coach is a bit like kind of wrestling with jelly. <laughs> I love that analogy, wrestling with jelly. <laughs> I mean, that's been really helpful for me because, you know, that's one of the reasons why I was so fascinated to get you onto coaching conversations. Because, you know, I've, you know, I've seen and I know and, you know, and, and uh, I've experienced career coaching. 
um, but not career change coaching. And that really sort of ignited a little bit of curiosity in me as to as to find out the difference, because it does sound like that although you can and, and you do work in both spaces, um, they are very different. Um, and what the, the client is potentially looking for could and, and, and will be potentially very different outcomes um, uh, uh, as a result, which, uh, which is fascinating. And what that tells me, Rachel, is there, there is just so many areas that coaching can infiltrate into. Um, and I've always said there's a coach for every person and for every person there's a coach. There's never a one size fits all and never should it be really. I think that's the that's when we we fall into dangerous territory where we start doing cookie cutter shaped, um, you know, sort of uh, coaches the, themselves. Before we move on, there's just a couple of things come um, into the chat box, which um, which I thought might be sort of interesting just to read out. So Fiona says, totally agree. This is my niche and feel it's really essential to begin. Oh. Um, it's a really essential place to begin. Oh, could somebody Please. just make sure that they're all on mute? That would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then once there, the ideas start to flow. So thank you for that, Fiona. Um, Amanda says, really interesting. This is one of my niches. And I find that often the, the client thinks that they want to change career. But once we start chatting, they actually want to feel valued. So new roles in the same organization. So that surprise says Amanda. Um, a question from Tricia. Do you have tools that you found particularly useful when supporting someone who is looking for career change? Tricia, you beat me to my next question. So let's just pause there and, and ask Rachel if she has uh, anything in particular. That yes, she by all means. Just, just to echo, I think, Amanda, I love your point there about um, people thinking they want to change careers and then realising it's not that radical that that's actually you saying about what's different about career yeah. change coaching is that people think that career change coaching is you know I was an accountant and now I'm a zookeeper and and when people come to me they one of the questions they sometimes ask is can you tell me what your clients end up doing almost like really impress me you know tell me that you had somebody who used to work on a farm and now is kind of the head of Barclays Bank or something it yeah. often doesn't really work like you do have people who make that sort of radical shift but definitely it's on a spectrum and I've got someone who features in my book whose name is Stuart who was a very unhappy lawyer and he's still a lawyer but he's a very happy lawyer because we figured out what wasn't working for him in his kind of the world of law that he was currently in we made some tweaks and it didn't take that much um, but people might think oh, that's a boring story. What do you mean you were a lawyer and you're still a lawyer? What was the point of the career change coaching if you haven't changed careers? But to him, he describes that as a total career change. Yeah. Because he, so I just wanted to kind of echo echo the point there from Amanda. But yes, um, tools and exercises. Yeah. So without looking like too much of a shameless pug, but it, this is a good way to you can have all of my tools um, because, as we said, so my book is called The Career Change Guide five steps to finding your dream career and and one of the steps is all about that period of sort of self-reflection and getting to know yourself so definitely the kind of tools that I start with they're in the book but clearly they're also things that you can find versions of online so it's not a hard sell I'm not suggesting you can't find these things I definitely work with people as most coaches will at some point in the coaching journey on their values where we're trying to say well what drives you you know is is work for you about collaboration and creativity and fun or is it about impact and purpose or is it about financial reward or is it about um, freedom and autonomy so the work around values and what lies behind what drives you at work is really important definitely I would do that I do quite a lot of work with clients on strengths so obviously there are kind of paid things you can do like strengths finders or, but just otherwise, if you want just natural things, ways of drawing out from the client, what do you enjoy? Keep a diary of your week at work. What are you good at? Where are you excelling? What was fun? So we definitely do work on strengths. I have an exercise that I get people to do on their interests, which, again, is mostly just a reflective exercise that they then bring to the sessions, looking at different parts of their life, what they like reading, what they like doing, who they follow on Instagram, what they like doing as a kid, how, what hobbies they have. You know, is there any information for them there? Maybe, maybe not. So all of those kind of reflective um, exercises I get people to do in between the sessions so that each session has a kind of focus. And sometimes we do more than one thing. 
Um, but yeah, I think some of those key puzzle pieces, if you're interested in sort of most people have come across Ikigai as well and the Japanese concept and those sort of circles that overlap about your strength, you know, what you could get paid for. So anything that sort of addresses some of those key pillars, I think, of career change. And as I say, there are lots of resources online um, or in books like mine or in books by people like John Lees. He's very good on career change. Of course, What Colour Is Your Parachute? Good old Richard Bowles. Um, those sort of things I think are really helpful, not as necessarily diagnostic tools. I think hold them lightly, I always say. People think you're going to give them an exercise and it's going to sort of tell them the answer. I always say to people, this, this, is, an, this is not a science, this is an art. This is a jumping off point. Try the exercise, see what comes up. If it leaves you cold, that's fine. We're not using these to spit out a magic answer. We're using them as a jumping off point. What did you notice? What's come up? What are the themes that we keep seeing when we're doing this work together? What are you noticing? What are you feeling? Where, where's the energy and the excitement? So that, those are some of the things I would do with people um, initially. Mm, fantastic. And, and I love some of those tools that you've pulled out because I think we we really underestimate the power of uh, working with clients to, I mean, it is all about awareness raising, isn't it? So we're raising the client's awareness of their strengths, of their values. Um, and, you know, if, if, if their values are out of alignment, but they're not aware of that, um, that could be the biggest light bulb moment um, of all. I remember working with uh, one uh, CEO of a company just recently, actually, we were working on, you know, there was um, there was some, a lot, quite a lot going on within the company and um, and she just needed pretty much a sounding board more than coaching. But we were doing some coaching stuff and she was talking about, do I jump ship? Is this time to move on? Um, and I just got to do an exercise, a reflective exercise, just what you like you were saying, Rachel, on, you know, when she was in flow. What was she doing when she was in flow? And that really helped her to sort of highlight the areas that actually made her heart sing. And, and so she could actually get back to sort of focusing on those particular areas. And, you know, what, what were the areas that, you know, that didn't make her heart sing and, and what could she do about those? So I think those are fantastic tools that, that you've particularly shared. Um, your, your book. Let's let's talk about your book because you've mentioned your book and and what I love about your book is it's practical. Being a very practical person myself, I use lots of tools myself. You know, I, I always say in my um, in my contracting with clients, you know, the type of coach I am, and it's not for everybody. I'm not. I'm not the sort of coach that will be right for everyone, but that's okay, you know. So I, I'm always very um, upfront about being a very practical coach and lots of tools if, if clients want to use them. Your, your book, your lovely book, was published this year, so congratulations. Big thing, and, and lovely to have Penguin, you know, to, to, to support you in that. Now, I, I know, because I speak to lots of coaches, qualified and in training, that have aspirations about publishing a book. Um, so I'm really just curious, if you don't mind sort of sharing, how did your book come into being? Yeah, happily. Do you know, I always feel a bit embarrassed telling this story because people come to me and they say, Gosh, can you tell me how to write a pitch and can you tell me how to find an agent in order to get to a publisher and and I can I have to say I can tell you none of those things because it was almost like it was just a kind of bolt of serendipity and I can only describe it as that and so I feel in a way a bit of an imposter sort of saying I've had a book published as if I had to work terribly I mean I worked terribly hard to put out the book but I was very fortunate so it was a very weird story so because I'm an ex-broadcaster, one of my the ways I try to do a little bit of marketing for my business is I, I like chatting. I'm happy to do sort of webinars and things like that. So podcasting and getting on other people's podcasts seemed like a, a good thing to do. So I managed to get myself on a pod podcast some people might know called Postcards from Midlife, ah, with, yes. um, which is a great podcast aimed at midlife women. It's done by Trish Halpin. Um, uh, and I forgot, forgot my brain in midlife has forgotten the other person, Lorraine Candy, both ex magazine editors. So they have a podcast. I got on that podcast talking about career change in midlife. I think that was in about June. I actually created a set of um, notes for myself on this because it's quite how people are often quite interested. So I reached out to them in the January of 2021, had to chase a little bit, got on their podcast in the July. 
went really well, had a few clients from it, didn't think any much more of it. In September of that year, an, an email dropped into my inbox saying, hello, my name is Fenella Bates. I'm an editor at Penguin Michael Joseph. Have you ever thought of writing a book? And I'm not kidding, Sharon. I looked at this, I thought, this person is having a laugh. This is a scam. This is one of those things where you say, I'd love to write a book. And they say, great, pay us 20,000 pounds and we'll publish it for you. You know, I just thought this can't be for real. But actually, I immediately got on LinkedIn. I'm looking up Fenella Bates, my penguin. I was like, oh, she's a real person and she's serious. So long story short, I said, well, I hadn't thought of writing a book, but I, you know, I'd love to. I'm an ex-journo. I like writing. I'm, I like communicating. And, and over the course of time, Fenella and I had had a couple of meetings over lunch. It was all very nice and publishy. Um, talked through the idea. Um, she said, well, you know, we are, I was fortunate. They were looking for a book of that nature on career change. I think because we were sort of in the middle of COVID, as you said, it's very zeitgeisty. They were looking for a sort of certain number of books to add to their stable of kind of how to books. So they just said, we're looking for that kind of book. Would you be interested? We chatted. She said, OK, this sounds good. This is what I'm thinking. Can you put together a kind of overview of the book? I think she gave me about two weeks and I'm thinking, I, I haven't written a book. You know, she said, I think it needs to be a sort of step by step. So I had to go away and almost sort of deconstruct my process fine tune it and so I put together this kind of I think 10 page pitch and she then takes it back to the people and it got through and over time yeah we started working together and that then was so I think it was formally commissioned in October 2021 and then over the course of I had to write it I think my first draft went in about five months later so they wanted it pretty darn fast <laughs> Um, and then there was a lot of then there's quite a slow process once you've submitted it of all the kind of back and forth editing and copy editing. And, and it finally came out in January of this year. But I feel like it was just a kind of a, I had a lucky I caught a lucky break and I've, I love doing it. It's been great, um, but it wasn't something that I had to kind of strategize and say, I'm going to write a book and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, but it's been an adventure. It's interesting you say I had a lucky break um, because I have a presupposition, a belief that actually we make our own luck. You know, it's not open to fate. And so your, you know, your um, your proactiveness in reaching out to um, to Lorraine to get onto the, the, the podcast with them, other podcasting, you know, being proactive and getting yourself out there um, made what you do a little bit more visible to somebody who was actually looking at that particular time. You know, everything's timing, isn't it? You know, so that particular time they were looking for a specific book, you know, uh, and you were you were visible. And, and it reminded me of a, a previous coaching conversation that we had with a PR expert, Amanda PR, she calls herself. And if, if those of you that are here today haven't seen that coaching conversation, I'd really highly recommend that you go back and have a look at it because um, Amanda was talking about how, um, and, and you may well uh, be able to, to add to this um, or, or not actually, uh, Rachel. Amanda was saying that you know, there are lots of sort of editors and journalists that are looking for good you know, good editorials, good stories, um, and um, and she certainly sort of gave a few tips on on being able to you know sort of get yourself in print. So it was quite sort of interesting listening uh, to all of that. So um, I, I thought that was a, a a really sort of interesting comment that you made. Um, what would you say your sort of biggest learning has been from that? From writing the book, yeah. Yeah, I've reflected on it quite a lot. And, and I always think I'm always happy to kind of share with people because I think people are curious and it's nice to be sort of as transparent as you can be. I think it's having a book is brilliant. I think it has given me several things. The first thing to say, it has not made me rich. <laughs> I always want to say to people, because people are like, oh, what? And I'm always happy to share these figures because I think people are interested. I love it when people let me under the bonnet of their business a little bit. So Penguin paid me £10,000, that not to be sniffed at, but I did a lot of work for that. And publishers, formal publishers pay it to you in, in tranches. So yeah. you get you get a quarter of it when you sign on the dotted line, just looking at my notes. So you get a quarter of it when you deliver the manuscript, you get a quarter when it's first published, but bear in mind, it, it took about a year from when I started. So I even then I, you know, it was, if you, don't, you do a lot of work before you see any money. Um, and then you get another 
the final quarter I still haven't had because that comes if it go, when it, if and when it goes to paperback. Um, so, and I got some money for doing the audio recording. That was fun as well for doing the talking book a bit. Um, so, so writing a book won't probably make a hell of a lot of money, particularly if, unless you become an international bestseller where you start to get into royalties territory, but most books never do. You, you're just paying back your advance basically. But what it has given me, it's given me, I think, it, I loved writing it because I like writing. It, it gave me several things. It, it's given me a, a, a credibility, obviously. It's a wonderful thing to be able to say I've written a book. People, And particularly to be able to say it's with a mainstream publisher, with Penguin. That said, I've, I've chatted, had lots of interesting chats with people who self-publish. There might even be some people on the call. I think there's absolutely, you know, people used to be a bit sniffy about that. Oh, is this self-published? But actually, I think it's still gives you, you know, you've shown that you can pull together some intellectual property, you've got ideas, you've got a, a method or a framework, you can maybe use, you know, if you self publish, you can maybe use your book, you can sell it yourself. So obviously, you're much more in control of the sales. With a with a mainstream publisher like I am, they pay you an amount. And that's pretty much going to be it unless you suddenly your book goes massive. Um, but it gave me credibility, gave me a lot of confidence, I think. I, you know, I'm very proud to be able to say I've written a book and I enjoyed writing it. It's given me a lot of, it, it forced me to almost distill a lot of my ideas. So it gives you a lot of content, obviously, that you can use on other platforms. It opens doors so that, you know, if, if I'm now pitching now to be on a podcast, I can say, hello, this is me. I've written a book. It's, this is it. Um, so again, it, it sort of opens doors. Um, it gives you material that you can then think, oh, maybe I could, I haven't done this yet, it's on my ever to-do list of, you know, could I turn this into a series of workshops or could I turn this into an online course? Or So it's been, it's been really good. So what I think I've learned is, I think perhaps what I got wrong is I, at the time, didn't perhaps make enough of it. What, what I noticed with, um, with a big publisher like Penguin, don't get me wrong, they've been brilliant and a lovely team I worked with, really good, but they work with a lot of people, including obviously a lot of really big names. So you're a, you're quite a small cog and they're very busy people. So I feel like what I would do differently if I did it again is, and it means overcoming the dreaded imposter syndrome of, well, I'm not I'm only a little new author and I haven't, so it's just a little book. And it's, you know, it's actually, I would have tried to shout a bit louder. And, you know, push a little bit more around the launch. I, I didn't do a launch part or anything. I felt a bit like, oh, I don't want to, don't want to blow my own trumpet. I don't want to be too, you know, somebody trying to be a bit like, look at me. Um, whereas I think actually, if you're going to do a book, whether you self-publish or do, give it some welly, you know, really sort of lean into it, be proud of it. And um, so now I'm almost a little bit late to the party thinking I need to kind of, and also it won't, it won't sell itself. You know, I have to, I sometimes have to remind myself, hang on, probably about time I mentioned on my Instagram that I've written a book again you know don't don't assume you know it's amazing I and mean, we your marketing experts will think about this uh, we'll talk about this but that sort of thing of I need to stop going on about this people will be bored and then six months later people say you a book you know these are people on your mailing list that, I didn't know you'd written a book and you're like oh my gosh I'm clearly not you know I'm not mentioning it enough so yeah there, there were kind of lessons around my own confidence around you know what I wanted to achieve there were lessons around having um a sense of pride in my own ideas um and my own intellectual property and yeah definite lessons on on how you share your story and how you get yourself out there and, and how you use resources like a book to open other doors how you kind of connect the different pieces of, of your marketing strategy and things like that mm. I love that and and the fact that actually you know so many of us don't we you know um we get in our own way <laughs> all that sort of conditioning around you know maybe it was parental conditioning or whether you know limiting beliefs around or you know or they think I'm big-headed as you say I'll blow my own trumpet and aren't they bored listening to it by now but it's really interesting I love the fact that you said you know just be proud of it and 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 just go for it give it some welly what would be your I mean that's great advice for somebody who who maybe is sort of in the process what would you say to somebody who really wants to do it and they're not quite sure of maybe what the first step would be for, for writing a book for writing a book yes yeah, sorry yeah, do you know, again, I always feel like I'm not the best, annoyingly, and I'm not trying to be, I'd love to have a better answer. Because I didn't have to do it, I don't know. I mean, I hear different things. So I, I occasionally get 
sort of coaching colleagues approach me and say, could you connect me to your editor at Penguin? And of course, I want to try and help. So I, I did message my editor and say, you know, when I get people saying, what should they do? Can they speak to you? I said, I don't want to like give you 100 people who now want to write a book because obviously she, she hasn't got that much time in the day. Some people talk about the fact that you need to, um, you know, work with a book agent, first of all, that actually there's a step you approaching a publisher directly may be quite hard. So sometimes it's sort of finding an agent, someone who will work with you, who will, who has those connections already. But of course, that's a cost. There's a cost in that. Yes. Um, but that's a thought sort of thinking about working with a book agent who, who knows the market a bit more, who knows how you write a pitch. Um, the other thing I hear, and again, you know, as I always say to my career change clients, you know, ask around, have more conversation, don't just take it from one person as gospel. But one thing I hear as well is that more and more in the publishing world, and maybe I fly in the face of this slightly, but publishers will want you to bring an audience as well, or they want you to be someone. I don't mean you have to be a major celebrity, although obviously that would help, but I certainly wasn't. But I think it's important if you're going to take a book idea to someone that you have a digital footprint because the first thing they will do of course is look you up and if they've got nothing and I'm you know maybe that Instagram isn't your thing or you know you, you don't like making videos or but if you're any you know you I think you need to think I need to start giving them something that when I go with my pitch they can say oh Sharon Lawton there oh look at she does these amazing videos on LinkedIn or she puts up some really interesting kind of thoughtful articles or she obviously shares this or her website is full of it she's got amazing blog it's really funny or it's you know I think you want to be thinking about what's the kind of brand that people will find when they go looking for me what evidence can they already see that I can a write or communicate or I've got new ideas or I'm kind of different because that helps and obviously I've heard people say it's great if you can be someone who comes with a following now I don't have a massive following I think I've got 3,000 followers on Instagram but you know obviously if you've come with a bigger following that you, they know as well that if they take a chance on you, they're tapping into an existing market because they can say, oh, you know, Stacey or Trisha or Maureen, who's pitching this book, has got a very healthy kind of lot of followers who would love this book, who would immediately. So they know that you're selling something that has buyers, things like that to think about. But I don't know. I'm sure that's not the only way because that can feel very intimidating and certainly wasn't quite how I did it. But I, I think that there's lots of really helpful stuff in there. And um, actually, you know, that sort of uh, leads me back to coaching conversations for next month, which is all about, you know, networking and developing your brand and making an impact. So thank you for joining up the circle there. That was really helpful. <laughs> Before we start coming to a close, I just want to dive back into the chat box. Uh, there's a couple of sort of interesting questions sort of going back to the whole career change and and how you work. Um, and um, Rebecca has asked in the in the chat box, hi, Rachel, what helps you to overcome the fear factor for your clients um, that might stop them from a career change? So uh, helping clients to overcome their fear. Is there a particular tool or an approach that you use? You know, I was wondering when you were asking about what makes career change coaching different. I suppose it's not different because we see this a lot in, in all realms of coaching, don't we? But yeah, that mindset work, the limiting beliefs and things show up a lot in this space because people make a lot of assumptions. So doing some of those classic sort of work with clients, whether that's an exercise about, you know, what, what assumptions are you make? What are the beliefs you're holding around this, which are often things like, I would have to take a massive pay cut. I would have to start at the beginning. I don't have the right skills. No one will take me seriously. So I do do quite a bit of work with my clients around those limiting beliefs and, and saying, you know, what evidence do we have for this? And, and that's not to say, you know, it is, it is quite a challenging space to work in because sometimes obviously if someone's, you know, they're a city banker earning 500 grand and they want to be a poet, they're not going to be able to maintain that salary. So there are choices to be made. So this isn't kind of the realm of, you know, fridge magnets. And if you can dream it, you can do it. But it's sort of how do you get that balance of allowing them to feel inspired, to go after something they want, to not to, to find out what's doable, but without kind of getting crushed by this sense of, oh, everything's impossible and I can't do it. Um, and obviously anybody, who, most of us have had a career change. We know that massive thing that hits you of like, 
oh gosh, I'm, I used to be really good at something and now I'm a new coach. And so I, I don't really know what world I'm in and this feels scary. And who will, who am I to say I'm a coach? So actually having lived it yourself as a coach often is puts you in a good position to, to try and support people and say, you know, I've made a career change and, you know, I, I can empathize. I know these feelings of imposter syndrome and beginner syndrome, as I like to call it, things like that. But I, I would say nothing that you won't be familiar with. It's all classic limiting beliefs kind of territory. Mm, brilliant thank you I think you know, it's really helpful to know that our fundamental tools are there for us to use regardless of what niche that we're working in I think it's important for us to remember that I think for me as a as a coach and a newly qualified coach I was hungry to collect as many tools and ideas as I could so that you know I could sort of share them with my clients so they'd all have these sort of road to Damascus changes sometimes we forget the core stuff is the transformational stuff so what you were saying at the beginning around values and, and, and strengths, etc. So brilliant. Thank you for that. Now, I always ask um, all of my uh, guests to sort of leave us with maybe sort of a, a parting sort of comment or sort of tip, a takeaway tip. So if you maybe had one thing that you would like somebody listening today, either on the replay or here live to take away and maybe actually for themselves or maybe to reflect on with or without their clients what what might you you suggest Rachel sorry I've just put you right on the spot here. no I'm remembering you did tell me you were going to ask me this Sharon and I'm like oh my preparation fell down um what would I tell people I would say that let me keep it specific to this niche that we're in because you do so many brilliant things so the career change thing is I think it's about helping your clients with that right balance of thinking and action. That's the fire. There's some thinking to be done in career change coaching, but people cannot make cannot think their way into a career change. And you, I think that's one of the dangers when you start in this space is you you start with all the tools and then great, but you can quickly end up going around in circles. So what you also want to encourage for your clients is that they need to get out in the world. And that's where it gets scary, that if they have an idea about something, how can you support them as they take action to go and explore what it would be like to be a graphic designer? How can they explore whether they might be able to go and work in HR, even though they used to work in finance? It's helping them then with that combination of thinking, of action taking, of um, getting their mindset straight. Um, and I think contracting, we haven't even touched on that, but contracting carefully with them so that in that career change space, you are still a coach. You are partnering with them on a journey. You are challenging, supporting, helping them see new perspectives, but you don't have the answers. And I think that can be difficult territory for career change because you're not saying I'm a career advisor who's going to tell you what job to do. You're not necessarily saying I can write your CV or your LinkedIn profile, although if you're someone who has those skills, great thing to be able to bolt on in this in this niche. Um, so it's also about managing expectation and making you sure you contract really, really well with them for this is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. And together we can really make this work. I love that, Rachel, particularly around when you just made the, the comment around I'm not a career advisor. Um, and I've heard that sort of in my own network with uh, with colleagues of mine that are working in this space that sometimes in that sort of discovery call potential clients you know come with the thought process that actually you're a career advisor which obviously if you've made clear is very very different um, and the takeaway for me for sure is uh is that the thinking versus action and not being able to think yourself into a new career it's all about taking action so thank you thank you so much well, I have really enjoyed this hour. It's been a brilliant conversation and I'm just checking in the, the chat box again. It's just so lovely um, that all, all of the fantastic comments that are coming in. And, and Reg has said, as a career coach myself, this has been a great use of my time with understanding the different ways to serve my clients. So I think that's really a, a lovely testimony to our conversation. Um, and I agree to what you've just said in the chat box there it's been great energy I love your energy Rachel that's why I was looking so forward to our conversation today um, and so everybody listening 
thank you um, for coming along and joining us. Without you, there would not be a coaching conversation. So please do make sure that you spread the word. And my challenge to those of you that are still here, bang on one o'clock, is make sure you've written something down. Attending versus action yeah so just to sort of jump on Rachel's little thing so you know write something down that you are going to take away what's been your learning point what's been your light bulb moment to take away and I look forward to seeing you all on coaching conversations next month with the lovely Artie Palmer but from me Rachel and Maria and the whole team here at the coaching academy have a lovely rest of your week and see you next month take care bye bye thanks bye.